Thank you for uh, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for the uh, uh, introduction. It's very exciting to have uh, a new dean and exciting things for us as a whole, but also for the healthcare uh, community. But I will, um, I'll be brief on it. But I think there's a, a few exciting things, and you know, you're already here, so I don't really need to sell you on it. But uh, <laughs> what you, what to expect? Um, I think it, it is an exciting time, and I, the Berkeley advantage is actually a really nice way to frame it. Is that uh, and I will use even some of your uh, experience and my experience of juxtaposing, and this isn't throwing Wharton under the bus necessarily, but juxtaposing the two experiences. I think what is really exciting is the Berkeley difference in the sense of uh, going out and changing the healthcare world, changing the healthcare landscape, starting new companies, building bigger companies, you know, working for large companies, but doing so with an understanding of the broader context and a desire for the understanding of the broader context. And to me, I've seen that in spades upon arrival, and I think that's only growing. And to me, that means uh, understanding the policy environment, understanding, obviously, the business components, uh, and understanding the science behind it in many cases. And I think that confluence, um, regardless of whether you're going to actually be a bench researcher, probably most of you won't, right? You're not here for that. Um, but the desire to understand why and how things work uh, is really a, a level of curiosity that I clearly see all of you bring. Uh, and it's something that I think we have uh, hopefully tried to build upon in the healthcare program and as part of the, the MBA. And it really is integrating research. And I would encourage you also, and I'll talk slightly about my research, but more generally, um, we have a growing number of, um, I guess we're kind of young, uh, faculty who are uh, doing a lot of, I think, some of the most cutting edge research around kind of the combination of um, big data, health policy, health economics, uh, really uh, healthcare, uh, empirical social science, which ends up looking a lot like a lot of the exciting things that many digital health companies, many large companies that want technology or data science or, or some kind of play in that space really are looking at. And so I think that's something that we're both integrating more into the curriculum, but also I encourage you to reach out. And I'm my door is uh, definitely always open, um, as well as across the school. So Ziad Obermeyer in the School of Public Health, Ben Handel in the Economics Department. I think these, these are people who are interested in talking to you about your experience, but also in uh, helping guide you to different classes or uh, ask about kind of which startups are actually doing interesting things as opposed to just making nice websites, uh, which is hard <laughs> to figure out. Um, you know, but I think that level of maybe a little more inquiry into that, but that's something that is really, really exciting here. So um, I think that's a, a, a kind of something that I encourage all of you to take advantage of. If your first years, you know, get acclimated first, uh, but certainly happy to talk earlier. And then obviously those of you who are further along, I look forward to connecting with all of you. And what are your classes this year? Uh, I am teaching Big Data and Better Decisions. Um, I, so I see some familiar faces who survived. Uh, <laughs> Peter's got a beer, so he can say positive things about it. Uh, no, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so that will be in the spring for anyone who's interested. It's not a healthcare specific class, but it's co taught by myself and Paul Gertler. So there's a lot of healthcare examples. Um, and I think we really try to bring together. Uh, experimentation with machine learning, so it's not just the kind of fancy stuff, it's the core of how you actually do make data-driven decisions, build data-driven product. Uh, and that's also going to be in the weekend program if there's any weekend uh, interested folks here. And then I teach uh, health economics and policy every other year, um, and so uh, that will be going on next year. So um, for those of you who are around then, I hope to see many of you. Okay. Thanks, John. So I thought maybe I'd start out with a, a kind of a broad question for you. Uh, okay. It's election season, and we're seeing a lot of different proposals to either fix the ACA or move to a version of Medicare for all. So what impact do you think health reform is having on the healthcare marketplace? So, uh, you know, in, in many ways, it's a little bit uh, or a lot early to tell, but I think the we actually can take a lot from the ACA, blemishes and all, to think about um, the likely impact that any major policy reform would have. If you look at um, what I view as the, largely the successes of the ACA, the ACA was very effective on a lot, number of dimensions, but kind of ho holding some of the policy angles aside for a moment, 
I think what you saw uh, at the peak of the ACA when it was actually going to continue to be law and there wasn't all this uncertainty is a tremendous amount of innovation, a tremendous amount of strategic shift by large companies and small companies to uh, change the way healthcare was delivered, to change the way insurance plans were designed. I think at a simple level, a lot of the regulatory framework basically shifted strategic behavior by insurers from uh, effectively, you know, the, the biggest reward was from getting the, the lowest, low, lowest cost enrollees or lowest cost relative risk adjustment, however you want to play it. The actuaries ran the strategy department to uh, basically much less ability to do that and much more of a focus on building uh, models that basically manage disease better because then those enrollees were going to come. So instead of avoiding diabetics, you had to have a program to manage diabetes. Um, it was not a panacea for everything, but I think you saw that uh, not simply in the policy discussion, but really if you, down to the level of startup saying, I can now build something um, that actually improves patient health, and I'm going to get paid for it in the at least medium run, um, which is good enough for startup. Uh, and I, I think that kind of um, overlay we can expect from any major policy change, um, be it all the way to uh, some kind of Medicare for all. And we, I think you know we'll probably come back to this a few times. But you know, really, even today, uh, CMS and uh, public entities lead a lot of the innovation, um, even if it's simply that they'll pay for innovation. So if you look at kind of a lot of the successful models particularly from startups and new technology companies in the um, health services and health delivery space, they have to get public payers in some capacity. So even if we literally move towards some kind of Medicare for all, um, that would likely open up a, even more new opportunities um, for startups. Um, that said, I think we can, uh, the challenges of timing uh, over some of the proposals, I think, you know, we have 18% of GDP flowing through our healthcare system. Um, about 55% of that is private. Um, I think there's a lot of rationale for efficiencies and efficiencies driven by a public option, but uh, moving there very quickly is likely to be a challenge on that front. Do you think employers would rather not have to? worry about providing insurance? Uh, uh, I think many would, uh, yes. I mean, I, I think that's the a very, uh, you know, employer-based insurance is an artifact of World War II uh, wage controls. Um, and, you know, that's actually an interesting uh, area of research that I'm getting into more and more now is asking whether we see innovation from private insurers that ostensibly they're supposed to be selling to employers. Uh, and also, frankly, uh, you know, one rationale for employer-based coverage has been that that's a natural pooling mechanism, that you don't get a job because you're healthy or sick. Um, but increasingly, as we're more divided uh, along income lines, along, you know, that's correlated with health. And it's true that the differences in benefit generosity matters for the cost of health care, but it's also true that traditionally blue-collar jobs are much more expensive to manage the care for the observationally equivalent population. And so this is a disadvantage um, for those industries, for those firms that have legacy workforces. And I think it's, it is uh, encumbering a lot of the companies. You know, Increasingly, companies refer to themselves as health benefits organizations that do you know, whatever it is their website says they're supposed to do. And I think that's not a business many of them want to be in. Um, and in fact, some new work uh, with David Sreyer and the finance department that we're working on actually even shows that within a firm, even within large firms, because some treatments are so expensive, it's not even obvious that they would want to be the pooling mechanism that they've traditionally been. So there's a lot of rationales um, that, that you would expect employers not to want to be in this business. I think the main push against that, and this is true even in the ACA, where there was lots of prognostication about lots of employers dropping people mm -hmm. and going on to the exchange. Ultimately, if they can strategically offer a benefit that matches their employees better, and basically, you know, if you think about them paying wage and fringe benefits, if they're going to be able to do so more strategically to retain the right, the right folks, that can be to their advantage. So that's a big difference that, from the predictions versus what you saw at the ACA. But assuming um, the regulatory backbone and the product offerings can be made such that the exchanges or Medicare for all or some outside option uh, I, I'm guessing you would not see a lot of uh, 
complaints from the C-suite or the, the CFO in particular uh, of shifting this, and probably not even from HR of shifting this off the rules. Okay, let me let me just shift to Kim here. Sure. So, Kim, we've all watched the the pre-presidential debates, the debates, with, yep. and everyone has their own version of a healthcare plan. What what would you recommend we look for when we're when these candidates are telling us how they're going to fix our healthcare model? Yeah, I think a lot of it is is as how many are moving past sort of this the rhetoric of, of of single payer and who has actually has a plan. I think that what's missing for me is any depth of policy. I think right now we're still mired in sound bites and you know as John said, you know we have a significant percentage of the country that's 55 percent that's on employer based insurance. The idea that you would just sort of remove that that quickly overnight and just seamlessly move to a model of single payer Medicare for all is fiction and and the idea that well who's going to step in and pay that we're in an era where the government is signaling strongly it doesn't want to pay for more health care and so how would they be willing to take that on you know, John referenced the 18 percent GDP you know where would we go with that so I would ask candidates who push along those lines to be a lot more detail oriented about well, what is the financing mechanism? What are the details? What's the transition plan? And let's be clear, this would probably be a 10 to 20 year transition plan. This would take a long time to do. And I don't think people realize that. I think they're hungry for some change now. And so would you be, as a populist, okay with incremental change in the moment, um, which is often what we get? Or is there an appetite for profound change? And, and generally with healthcare, that's difficult. The Affordable <laughs> Care Act was the first profound insurance reform since Medicare Medicaid which was in the 60s so we don't make profound uh, you know, breakthrough uh, change in healthcare easily in this country. And so, um, but I think a lot of this is that it, it, it's a very, as we always joke, it's very complicated, right? Healthcare's complicated, who knew? And so undoing things and reworking things, it's, it's not a political soundbite. It would affect a lot of people. And so I'd be looking for more depth and rigor. Um, also an answer to a bunch of the different lobbying entities that would have a problem with it. For example, hospitals have already come out very strongly in the negative. And so if you've got your predominant sort of healthcare provider organizations saying uh, no, thank you, we don't enjoy not breaking even at Medicare rates today and the idea that all of this or a, a public option that would be even more public where we're a price taker, so to speak, we're not so down with that. We're struggling now. We have a variety of unfunded mandates. We have other things that we're dealing with. You're asking us to move to different payment mechanisms and population health. If you strap us financially even further, we can't do that. And so they're all, the American Hospital Association and other entities have come out pretty strongly against any of this, the Medicare buy-in, public option, Medicare for all. So you'd have to have a plan for managing when a large, powerful stakeholder is, is not, on, not on board. So, so let me ask an even broader question here. So I was having lunch with the dean of the engineering school a week or two ago, and I asked her, what are the areas that engineering is moving into? What are your priority areas? And one of the areas that she really emphasized was healthcare. Um, so engineering is really moving into healthcare mm -hmm. as an important component. And uh, I also spend some time with our real estate group, uh, and they meet in this pebble beach. Don't laugh. They have <laughs> meetings biannually. And any of you also doing real estate? No? Uh, they also meet biannually in Pebble Beach. And one of, the, one of the panels actually was on where real estate investors should move in the future. And one of the most interesting commentaries was, was by, so we had t two different positions on where the investments in real estate should go into in the future. We had this guy named Sam Zell, who's a very famous real estate mogul based in Chicago, who basically looks for areas to invest in where essentially there's limited competition and you can make huge markups. And he's very straightforward about that. So the area he's been investing in is mobile home developments. Apparently there's not a lot of competition in mobile homes. But then there was another person there and he said the area he's working in, and I forget what the euphemism was, but it was something like managed care communities. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you know what that is. It's not what you think. It's actually, um, it's sort of, it's basically communities where people need tremendous assistance mm -hmm. because they're either suffering from Alzheimer's yeah. or dementia. And he thought this was going to be a very large growth area in the future. And he got, a, people gave him a hard time in this real estate group, but if I think if it was this group, you would fully understand the importance of that going into the future. And the bottom line is healthcare expenditures now account for something like 18%, mm -hmm. as you heard. Of, GD, of GMP, it's a really big growth area. Uh, what do you think of that? Do you think that's a good thing, a bad thing? You don't think we should worry about it? Both of you, do you have opinions on that? The GDP number or the, uh, the assisted GDP, living? The GDP, <laughs> the GDP number. Uh, though I do remember being in Japan about 10 years ago where the age distribution is really, and going to a presentation of a completely robot run old folks home and the car would come and pick them up with this gurney and take them where they wanted to go. Uh, I don't think it exists, but uh, the plans are out there. <laughs> wow. um, so, uh, I mean, I think this is, a, this is a classic question. And, you know, it, it's interesting, and it gets back to kind of why healthcare might be different. So if you think about uh, a rich country, a rich society, let's ignore the distributional consequences, as you get richer, basically, uh, Healthcare becomes more valuable. So if you think about having, you know, ten cars in the garage, another year to drive all of them is more valuable than an additional car. Um, and so there are uh, some reasonably, you know, good calibration exercises or estimates of saying, well, actually, we should maybe be spending even more. Similarly, uh, if you look at the average return on spending in healthcare, if you said, would I go back to 1965? expenditures, which is about 5% of GDP, uh, for 1965 care. I think most people probably would not make that trade-off, that they would prefer uh, a s smaller non-health consumption for all of the longevity, morbidity, morbidity and mortality re returns we've had to this point. Where we find the waste and what exacerbates people is in a variety of areas, but um, it's an administrative overhead, uh, things that are at least peripherally related to your healthcare delivery, but behind the scenes. Uh, and it's in basically delivering the wrong expensive goods to the wrong people. And I think that's where the challenges come. Uh, and actually, you know, the, the advantage, the advantage for everyone here is, you know, at some point when you're getting close to 20% of the country's income uh, or product, you're talking real money. And so figuring out how to more effectively allocate resources is a tremendous benefit. Um, but the notion, the knee-jerk notion, which is certainly implicitly out there, that we know we spend too much on healthcare, I think is not, uh, not obvious. Um, uh, it's certainly, we need to be much more efficient, and there's clear waste. But if you had to say, if we can't figure out where that is, should we cut it all back? Uh, I, I think you'd have a hard time not making that argument. Kim? You... Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I think on one hand, especially folks like yourselves who are looking for promising careers over time, I, I'm guessing you'd like to be paid. And so like, the idea that it's 18% and growing to 20, those, a lot of that is people, it's salaries. And so, you know, we, we have a robust, thriving uh, industry. We want to be able to pay people. You know, so employment is big. I mean, if you ask, like, what's one of the biggest tech sectors in California, it's the life sciences aspect. I mean, it's second only to computer I mean, like, it's a big part. So the engine that healthcare provides is important um, from exports and, 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 and just the investment. So that is one hand. On the other hand, I agree with John, there are areas where we need to figure out how to work at it because we're probably spending more than we want. Some of you would look to some of the outcomes that we get vis-a-vis -vis other countries that spend less. Are we feeling like the value equation there makes sense, life expectancy, life expectancy infant mother mortality, things like that. There's a lot of data points where you can say, well, actually, maybe we're not figuring it out. The trick, though, is like what John said, is it's not easy to figure out, well, what would you cut? You know, across the board, 
cuts um, are blunt and they're not going to necessarily be equitable, fair, or target what we want. And so the trick is how do you take the system that we have and move it to something that we want? And we've been on that journey to an extent with payment reform, fraud and waste, and other, other programming, but you know, at some point we might get impatient that we're not making so enough progress. What, what would kind of policies would you recommend to accelerate the transition? Well, it's tricky. I mean, I think in this in this administration, it's 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 hard because they're more looking at well, maybe look at hospitals. They're about a third of court, you know, more of the cost. Let's just budget cut through Medicare rates, and you know, there's some very blunt levers, very obvious ways, and I, those wouldn't be my preferred ways to do it. Um, other people would say what we need is more competition. We don't have enough competition, so we need things like price transparency, um, less consolidated markets. You know, a lot of the data shows how consolidated hospital markets and health plan markets. Are. Uh, some of us went to a talk the other night at the Commonwealth Club. We heard um, Ovik Roy, who's a conservative thinker, talk about sort of the conservative perspective on health care. And he was like, I'm all for everybody having uh, coverage and access. He's like, but you know, right now, structurally, there's issues in the market with this consolidation. How would we change that? And he was positing a 30 to 40 year plan to reframe the market. And so um, I think that's tricky. I mean, personally, I think what's exciting and what I think a lot of you are excited by are these more targeted initiatives around innovative ways of moving care to lower cost settings, using technology in better ways. How do we do things with the innovations that we see coming that we have that begin to help us bend? Um, also, I do think this issue of the aging is really going to be very important. I mean, this, this idea that we can all age in place, age at home is great. We, who wouldn't want that? Um, but the reality of that is more challenging if you bring in and you look at the statistics epidemiologically wise, prevalence of Alzheimer's, dementia. It's going to be a complicated thing to sort out how we're going to manage this. So this real estate notion, you know, depending on how it's carried out, I mean, we actually are going to face a, se a severe shortage. I, I'm in a sandwich place now where raising kids and a lot of my friends are also managing parents who are in decline. And it's pretty tough out there if you have a parent with dementia trying to find um, a place that you feel safe that you can afford. Um, so I think we're going to have to grapple with a lot of that. And so how that sheer spend crowds other things out. That's the other argument, right? It's the crowd out. Are we not spending enough on education and other things because we're spending it so on So you said that innovation technology might be a solution. You want to share with us your, both of you, your coolest technology innovation that's moving the needle? Coolest is a very, you have, yeah. don't no, need no, to leave them. Uh, I, I have lots of favorites. I mean, I do think there's a lot of exciting things happening in chronic disease management. Um, you know, things that are trying to help providers do better with the payments that they have. I think companies like Flatiron sitting on huge amounts of data to help oncologists and patients function in, in these newer environments. You know, we spent a lot of time in class, right, talking about fee for service and how to get off of that and move to systems that have um, the incentives that we think are better aligned with population care and hopefully cost trend bending. So I think um, enterprises that are using big data and showing people ways, Cuventus, uh, you know, there's different pockets of things where we need to use data more intelligently to find the waste that John mentioned, to better optimize um, operations, and then to help people get care when they need it, how they need it. You know, John also mentioned this, are we giving care at the right time to the right people? No, very rarely, in fact. And so using technology so that if you're, I, I have a high school intern, and so she was doing a paper for me on digital therapeutics and AI, and I was trying to help her understand when would digital therapeutics be relevant for her? And I said, well, you're under a lot of stress right now, right? Studying for that ACT, SAT, you're probably not sleeping that well. You're stressed, you know, <laughs> going to the doctor for that seems a bit overkill and not very convenient. But what if there was a really, a, an FDA cleared app or like an extension, some of you know pair therapeutics, right? Like what if there's something for you that helps you manage that when and how you need it so that then your panic attack subsides and you can move freely. Like those things are what we need to figure out how to do, how to get care to populations when and how they need it. And I think there's great promise in technology for that. Uh, I would say two big themes, and I won't name names of specific companies, but I think where the most exciting uh, stuff is, is where uh, particularly sort of on the, the business is doing the business of healthcare. So uh, that's a lot around this administrative waste component. I think that's somewhere where everyone can agree uh, it's not controversial. You know, I think 
the idea is, and there's maybe some in this room, I doubt it, but I don't know. I'm sure there are. You know, they're replacing doctors. How do you get amazing economics in, yeah. in healthcare? Well, you say, I'm going to do this online, but then but the doctor does it now, and they get paid a ton, and, you know, we're going to do this. And, and I think that's you know, sort of this idea that technology, which we've seen in much simpler settings, just replace humans. Uh, is unlikely to be fruitful. So it's hitting, the, it's targeting the waste there, and then it's augmenting the existing assets, namely doctors. Um, we still send the best of artists to medical school for a reason, and building technologies, be they data technologies or other, to augment that or to give innovation, I think, is the sort of the more exciting domain. So I'm much more skeptical of be the kind before, of replacement. Before we turn to Q and A, tell us a little bit about the. Uh, the company Pickwell that you founded. Um, sure, uh, it's. Uh, I try to forget about it. Uh, no, it's. Uh, uh, I founded. We are the uh, backbone of a number of large health insurance exchanges. It's been an interesting experience, particularly as a uh, a faculty member. And uh, you know, they always say there's never a good time to start your own company. But I think the month after you have your first child, when you don't have tenure, <laughs> is not a good time to do this. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, you know, <laughs> what that's hindsight is 2020. Uh, so we basically built a company that is uh, AI-based uh, decision support for insurance enrollment. It's been, and you know, I'm happy to talk to anyone about the ups and downs of doing this. I built all the original algorithms. I hired many of the original team. I fired much of the original team. Uh, I've seen it finally turn around, uh, and, and we're now actually putting a, putting out a an academic paper on this as well as others showing the impact. And so it's been been very exciting to see it happen, but basically. Uh, Tell us exactly yeah, what, what it does. What does it do? So basically we, uh, we um, are, if you want to enroll in health insurance, uh, basically you want to understand for you what the right plan option would be. And that requires a pretty complicated calculation. Oh, I get so, it. Pick well. Select yeah. properly. Okay. Uh, what, what is your spending going to be like? How do you feel about risk? Effectively, think about if you could have a summary of if a million people made the same decision you're about to make, uh, how often would they be right? Uh, and that's both on your preferences and on your risk type. And so uh, that's now been deployed. It's made about 5 million recommendations. Um, we save in Medicare alone, uh, saved about $60 million last year for enrollees. So it's, uh, it's, it's exciting to see it out there. That's very exciting. Very exciting. Um, well, so uh, should we move to, we're going to move now to Q&A so that you guys can have a chance to, to talk to people directly. We have some microphones. We already have a hand up. Uh, hey, Dina Harrison. Thanks so much for coming. Um, everyone in this room came to Haas because of healthcare. And disproportionately, we are uh, Dooley students and AKA Kim students. Um, <laughs> and we clearly are, Haas is ahead of the pack from a healthcare perspective, but there are a number of other programs that are working towards healthcare as a focus. If you look at Kellogg, their specific strategic goal is data science and healthcare. And so my question to you is, what types of things can we do as a student body and can they do as a faculty to signal to you and other leaders in the program that health is really important? And I say that with a backdrop as, and I spoke with CMG today, and through their recording, only 5% of students go into health care. However, I would argue that at least 10% of the class is interested in health care, and just due to like which box do you tick, it's a little bit uh, biased in what information is chosen. So, Again, just to reiterate, like what information is relevant to you uh, or signals relevant to you and other leaders in the program to show that healthcare is truly important in Haas and we need to further stay ahead of the pack compared to any other program in the country? Well, just um, telling me what you just said is a good start. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. Um, do you, do you want to? Uh, this is very helpful. This is, again, telling us. For those of us who walk into faculty meetings and make that argument, it's also helpful because I think that's, uh, I, I think it is from a, if you just, you know, I know economics, but um, a lot of the talented young economists are focused on healthcare, and I think that's another domain where it would be exciting to have uh, additional folks um, creating that nexus uh, in the latter faculty. Um, I think the fact that the program has grown so quickly in the last several years could be one reason for why the Career Management Center hasn't quite caught up. 
Um, but we, we can certainly speak with, to Abby about that. If you have specific recommendations or suggestions, you should email them to me and I, I will get in touch with, with CMG, talk to them about it. Hi, I'm Rachel Park. I'm a 2016 alum of the dual degree program. Hi, Kim. I'll hug you after this. Um, so five years ago, I was sitting in Kim's class, and four and a half years ago, I was in John's class. And at the time, I think there was a lot of excitement about how new startups and disruptors would either displace or significantly um, shift the behavior of incumbents, like large pharma companies, health systems, and insurance companies. And I think what's happened over the last five years is that a lot of them have realized that those are the people who have the money, and so those are now their customers. And so I'm curious of your perspective on how much disruption there truly is or how much this wave of innovation is either changing the behavior of the incumbents or just reinforcing the current healthcare system structure. Sure. Uh, I, I mean, I think that it, you, you hit on the head why disruption is maybe not as glamorous in healthcare. You know, you don't uh, instantaneously uh, go out and just create Instagram and everyone starts using it because it has a nice, uh, you know, front end. Uh, I think disruption looks much more incremental uh, simply because of the scale and the stakes. It's a little bit of a version of what I was saying earlier of medicine is still about people's health. It still involves doctors. It still involves high stakes decisions and complexity. And so it's just necessarily uh, more complex. Now, does it have to be as complex as our system? Probably not, but it's, it's you know, in aggregate, I think it's meant that uh, those small entities have had to sell through basically the B2B to C model that everyone now knows is the, the, the way to go um, is partially a function of that you know, the complexity that you can, and it's also frankly focused, you know, innovation is usually doing a particular thing really, really well. Well, that particular thing usually doesn't solve all of healthcare, right? So you, you kind of have to go in and, and um, be that focused there. I think also, and it gets back to the original question, which is how does the policy environment matter? I think it's been challenging because a lot of companies that were small but getting good contracts and good traction and it still was terrible to sell into insurers, but it was doable. The uncertainty has filtered down in a very challenging way. And it hasn't all come out because a lot of them raised really, really big rounds, so it takes a while to figure out that they actually aren't selling. But um, nobody here, I'm sure. But, uh, uh, but I think you, you know, if we don't resolve that uncertainty and there is sort of business as usual, you also run into the situation where uh, it's difficult even to do that, let alone sort of disrupt the whole thing even to get those contracts with the folks that, that are out there seeing patients. Yeah, I would agree. I would say that I think five years ago we were hopeful that they would have um, an easier time in this sales cycle. So not just health plans, but hospitals. Incredibly hard to sell into really long lines. And it just turned out that you know, you're going to run out of money if you don't figure out a new strategy to partner um, or to be you know, acquired by. So I think a lot of them figured out quickly if they wanted to stay alive, they, they need, needed to think about it. I think many of them underestimated what it would take to convince different facets of the healthcare market that they, they were legit. Um, does it, you know, whether it's biomedical or whatever, they don't have an evidence pathway that was convincing. It's not a tech sale to these folks. It's a healthcare sale. And a lot of the healthcare sales, we're used to certain amounts of evidence about efficacy and safety because we're just trained by that because of the FDA at market access. And so a lot of these companies didn't have an appreciation or an in-house competency for what it takes to, to present. And if you just think about it, a lot of what they're trying to do is create a clinical change, often a behavior change, has to be a sustained behavior change. Oh, and then you need the economic, you know, upside from that. So the continuation of that, A, takes a lot of time, and it's very tenuous at all those different touch points. And so I think there was probably some underestimation of that. I think the current thing that's interesting is now is the disruption going to come from big tech. So every year I always ask my class, who's going to be the big tech disruptor? Is it Apple, Google? I think this class for the first time is not that enamored of Amazon. It barely comes up in class. <laughs> I keep pushing it, and I can't get anybody to bite. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm almost 
almost pushing it just for my own intellectual curiosity because of the last several years, it's been, I will sleep outside the door of Amazon until they open it and let me sneak in. And this current first year class so far, correct me if I'm wrong, but no one, it hasn't been that Amazon oriented. So it's interesting how that also shifts as we wait to see who's got the goods, who's gonna make the change. So it's, it's definitely, healthcare's harder to penetrate than it looks from the outside. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Perry Briskin. I'm a second year dual degree and co-president of the Haas Healthcare Association. Go Perry. So Go Dean Perry. Harrison will be setting maybe a meeting with you to talk about the future of our healthcare program. Um, but this is a question for Professor Kolstad and, and Kim. And I just want to know what the, theoretically, what does the health apocalypse look like? Um, and, and to say that meaning, you know, we're 18% GDP, you know, many years ago we were 10% GDP and they said it wasn't sustainable. Now we're 18%. What happens when we hit 20%, 25%? Like, what does that look like? Like we saw in 2008, the housing bubble. What does the healthcare bubble, in theory, look like when it bursts? And, and who are gonna, you know, I'm assuming, who are gonna be the casualties of that? So, uh... I mean, it's very different than a bubble in the sense that I think, you know, Kim hit on one of them, which is the crowding out. And I, I'm always, in some aggregate policy sense, skeptical of that argument because it's sort of saying, well, we have a fixed pie for public budget, and as it takes up more, it has to crowd it out. The other possibility is to expand that pie. But increasingly, um, in our less than super functional political environment, the idea that even if we literally couldn't educate our youth, that we could raise taxes is not obvious. And so that's, I think, where you, that starts to look, that version starts to look like the apocalypse. It actually probably won't come, I would guess, in healthcare. It would come in the form of the rest of it. And many, you know, you could make an argument we're seeing a lot of that already. Um, it also could come uh, in, though, I, again, I think there's a lot of uh, institutional uh, folks that would you know, you never know, but push back on this. I think moving too quickly uh, to something like knee-jerk single-payer without a planning, again, I, you know, I think there's a lot of rationales for some flavor of single-payer or managed competition, um, but something like we're going to blow it all up, you know, that could, obviously that would, by construct, yeah. be an apocalypse for it. Yeah. But again, I, I don't see it coming necessarily <laughs> in the healthcare apocalypse. system. It's. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I think, and, and even if you said we're going to blow it all up, it's not obvious we would do it wrong. I mean, Medicare was really built overnight, and much of the backbone of what still functions for Medicare was built by a bunch of young people at CMS in, in about a year. So it's not, it's not like even if we did that, it would necessarily be done wrong. Done wrong. But if you, ask, if you push me to say what could happen, but I do think it would actually be outside of healthcare, and in many ways, maybe we're already seeing it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's different sort of the more the macro effects. I, I had actually thought that perhaps in the, under the current administration, when there was um, Paul Ryan was still around, and there was a, there looked like to be some really marching towards. Um, I thought they were going to blow up Medicaid, and I thought the blow up of Medicaid was then going to have ripple effects that were going to really take down aspects of the system. So we were really looking at um, block granting Medicaid or per capita caps. I, I worried that that would destabilize so many aspects of care for the safety net, the ability for hospitals to. To, to function in so many parts of the country, um, I was really, really thinking that that could, and I was torn because on one hand, you have to almost have an apocalypse to rise up out of it, but the public health side of me said that the, the carnage of that, the, the difficulties and the challenges for the, for the underserved would be so, it wasn't worth it. So I wasn't wishing for that apocalypse, but I thought we were getting closer to it at that moment. Now, as we know, because of the divided house and the inability to pass any of this stuff, we're not really at that place. So we're still at the, what I call the general game of keeping pulling out key parts and waiting to see if the structure falls and I don't know I don't I don't actually think I think the structure generally has so many other invisible and visible supports that it's difficult to envision that crash but I thought we were I thought we were maybe getting really close when I thought we were going to um, I wasn't so much the repeal of the ACA as it was because that was more about Medicare expansion it was the additional aspect of um, changing the full underpinnings of Medicaid funding with block Answer per, that I was really thinking like that the blowback of that. Was yeah, I think to add, close. add to that quickly would be that that I think the opposite version of the single pair actually is more likely, which is um, you know what's worse than someone with no economics, a little bit of economics, <laughs> and um, and the idea that markets are, are good for 
a lot of this. Um, you really have that in the in the dyed in the wool. And so it probably will also, it has already come. You'll just have very big differences across states because of state policy, and there's going to be a bunch of market-oriented states that are basically not going to have uh, probably very high returns, and then you'd end up with a lot of people. In some cases, you already have it. A lot of yeah. people basically know it. And I think if you layer in on that things like the aging process, because most of you, I'm sure, are well aware, Medicaid funds most of the nursing home care. So as you bootstrap Medicaid, thinking, oh, we want people to have work requirements, we don't want to pay for all this stuff. It also is a heavy payer for nursing home care for everybody. A lot of people spend down, um, and it's also the major source of substance abuse and opioid programs. And so a lot of the states uh, with the most severe opioid programs are states that also have the sort of the thinnest Medicaid coverage, and if they were given permission to go even farther down that path, they might have their own in, in state level apocalypse as it relates to their ability to deal with the opioid crisis. And again, we don't want that. So there's no part of me that would want to see a, a crisis isn't worth it, but those are the spots where I think you would see radical difference in, in different state behaviors, and that could really trigger a lot of pain in a lot of states. We have time for one more question. Hi, uh, Sean Chattervetti. I'm an evening and weekend MBA, class of 2022. Just started a month ago. Um, thank you for this wonderful discussion. It's been really fascinating. Um, I work at a company called Humana, and uh, traditionally, <laughs> no, no surprise to anyone here, I guess. <laughs> uh, traditionally, I guess one of the biggest players in the Medicare Advantage space, and I particularly work on our mental health programs for our commercial business, who we consider as our next generation of, of the future of Medicare members of the company. Um, we struggle quite a bit um, within our company in trying to figure out how to um, come up with the right kind of evidence, the right kind of data, the right kind of um, studies that can feature the next generation of, of virtual care and digital health for our members. And being here in the Bay Area um, at Haas and working for a company that's based in Kentucky, um, it's really made me think about the, sometimes the, the disconnect between the innovation that's happening in digital health and where a lot of the levers are in, in paying for many of these services in the future. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think the role of payers can be in the future in driving innovation in driving um, the next generation of digital health capabilities um, and how to kind of bridge that divide that I've at least experienced in my work. Uh, you're critical. Uh, and in fact, if you don't do more of it, uh, we're going to end up with, uh, you know, that's, that's where the value add has to come. And, you know, that's actually a research area right now looking at basically what do payers actually, you know, can you identify evidence for innovation on these big, bending the cost curve, big ticket items. And, and the answer seems to me not really, with the exception of a few managed care organizations, mm -hmm. that, yeah, United's cheaper. They just do less of everything. They don't do, le you know, they don't do just efficient stuff. And for example, you know, we're looking at Intermountain, and, and, and you know, they are more expensive. They do more good stuff and more bad stuff. I think it really is thinking about the, you know, that's a sort of more macro view. But I think payers, it, it is bridging that gap, having experienced it. I mean, we, I, I sort of joked about the sales cycle, but there needs to be uh, more appetite to try new models to measure and to fail uh, at big payers. I mean, Humana actually is probably a, a more, uh, more innovative uh, than, than, than others. But I think that's going to be where, where the um, where the rubber is going to meet the road, where the new startups are going to actually grow, uh, and where the big payers. I mean, ultimately, if you're not bringing all the data and the evidence to actually get people the right care, why else are you there? Because then it really is just 15% of healthcare spending is an administrative overhead to maybe get some network prices, which is not enough to warrant that. Yeah, I would agree. I think we all want to see payers, you know, in, in fact, they've been sort of traditionally thinking, you know, we're risk-bearing entities, we pull the risk, we make the networks, we pay the claims, but a lot of that's been commoditized and, and farmed out to others. So now I think the value equation for payers is really a lot about, all right, well, what data do you have? And you are a good aggregator. I think a challenge with a lot of the digital health solutions is scale. How do you get them out to enough people? 
um, I would love you know more insight on why almost all of us have access to telehealth through our insurers and, and very few of us are using it. So how do you look inside and figure out well, what do you need to be doing better um, from a payer to use that upfront that you have and is it going to be what we see with like the Aetna CVS and you need a storefront or, 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 or is it some other way that you're going to communicate with your membership but I think A you sit on a lot of data and you have an ability to accelerate and scale like many others don't. You can see patients data in a way that a particular healthcare provider cannot. They may only have access to silos of it. So how best do you do you use that and bring that forward? Um, um, it, it, you know, and, and also, I suppose, creating um, incubation and safe spaces for, for startups to, to build that evidence. We were talking earlier about Evidation Health. There are entities out there that are trying to help this process. So how do you feed into that ecosystem and, and support that? Before um, we end, I just wanted to thank uh, Dean Harrison and, and John for being part of tonight and making time and coming. So it's been great to get to hear and, you know, the journey.